All right, here we go. This is part four in the series on women in ministry, my exhaustive... Ugh, I spent months preparing this stuff. Months. Uh, I've never spent so much time on one project, <clears throat> unless you count an entire book of the Bible, like Mark, where I spent uh, a lot more than months. But here's the basic idea for today's video in this series, this exhaustive series on women in ministry, everything the Bible says about it, tackling all the tough topics, and listening to every egalitarian argument, at least that I can find that it seems at least is worth talking about. And so here's an idea of... Um, so the sort of things you'll hear from egalitarians on the topic of where women, teachers, leaders, deacons, elders, or even officially apostles, this is an example of the type of argumentation you'll hear. This is coming from uh, N.T. Wright. The first people to be told to tell other people that Jesus is alive again, mm. Mary Magdalene and the others. Those who are the first to see the risen Jesus, those who are the first to be entrusted with the news that he has been raised from the dead. This is of incalculable significance. Mary Magdalene and the others are apostles to the apostles. We should not be surprised that Paul calls a woman named Junia an apostle in Romans 16. If an apostle is a witness to the resurrection, then there were women apostles before there were men apostles. Read Romans 16. Romans 16 is explosive. Paul greets all these church leaders in Rome, many of whom are women who are church leaders in their own right, one of whom is an apostle, he says so, junior, and she is an apostle. For Paul, that means somebody who has seen the risen Jesus and is thereby commissioned to be an authorized representative. Mm -hmm. The first woman mentioned in Romans 16 is the bearer of the letter to Rome. The probability is that the first person to expound Paul's letter to the Romans was a woman, a deacon from the church in Kenkrei. And I want to say, get used to it, guys. <clears throat> Get used to it, guys. <laughs> um, so this is this is some of the argumentation I heard as I started digging deeply onto this topic. I wanted to hear the egalitarian stuff that I'd never heard before, having been mostly exposed to complementarian circles. So there will be timestamps for today's video. If you come back a few hours later or maybe tomorrow, we will put timestamps down below so you can navigate yourself around to the specific issues we're going to deal with. But just as a recap, here's the complementarian view that women were in all sorts of roles, but not the elder or apostle role. Generally speaking, there, there's always different group, groups in the camp, right? But not elder, not apostle, but all sorts of other roles, yes. The explicit teaching from the New Testament, according to the complementarians, is that women are not allowed to be elders, like that they don't qualify, to put it more carefully, they don't qualify for the requirements of eldership. And that's where the teaching authority in the church is, at least institutionally and regularly. Now, the egalitarian view, the other side, they're going to say, hey, you've completely misread the New Testament here. Uh, women filled the highest possible roles, and only years later in church history, they were slowly excluded from those types of roles because of the patriarchalism of the surrounding cultures. Um, there's another al an alternate egalitarian view, because I see both in the literature and the, the, the sources I'm reading. An alternate view is that women occasionally are seen in the highest roles in New Testament times, just occasionally. But when they aren't, when they're specifically told they can't do a certain role, it's not because of any lasting rule from God, no universal restriction. It's because of cultural issues. That's it. And so they're going to build a case for why this is local cultural problems we should not, you know, put into our lives today. So that that's the basic angles they're going to take on the New Testament text. So we're going to look at deacons and elders and the, the role of women in, te in teaching in the New Testament. But let me give you more. <clears throat> Here are the quotes from the egalitarians that will say, um, it'll basically give you an idea of the types of claims they make. Not only the, the clip I played from uh, N.T. Wright, who's egalitarian, but also here's a, a quote from Linda Belleville, who says about women leaders in the, in the New Testament times, that there was, quote, no lack of women leaders in the early church. <clears throat> there was no lack. You would not look around and be like, why aren't there more women leaders? Because they were there. There was plenty of them. Then there's a, um, a, a longer quote from Linda Belleville on this same topic. And she says, male leaders may have been more numerous, but virtually every leadership role that names a man also names a woman. In fact, there are more women named as leaders in the New Testament than men. Phoebe is a deacon and a benefactor, Romans 16, 1 and 2. Mary, Lydia, and Nympha are overseers of house churches. Let me say that again. She claims Mary, Nympha, and Lydia were overseers of house churches. Euodia and Syntyche are among the overseers and deacons at Philippi. The only role lacking specific, male, uh, specific female names is elder, 
but then male names are lacking as well. I'm going to have to end up disagreeing with a lot of this stuff, but that's, that's the quote. Um, she even goes on to say that there were female apostles, prophets, teachers, and, and evangelists. So th this is obviously the, the egalitarians and the complementarians are looking at the same New Testament extremely differently. They're like not at all remotely close to how they're perceiving the text in front of them and the history of the events. Here's Craig Keener, another egalitarian. He says, Paul applies the same titles to ministries of women as to those of men, and he explicitly affirms women in the most prominent ministry roles of the early church. So there, there's another quote from an egalitarian to say, hey, yeah, look, obviously, if you, if you like me, were sort of raised in complementarian circles, you're like, either I've very much misread the Bible or, or not noticed, which is totally possible, right? Just not notice things because of, because of my own tradition, church tradition, or they're reading a bunch of stuff in the text that doesn't belong, but it's, it's like one of the others going on here and we will be digging into it today. So if they're right though, it's powerful. Um, like if the, if the egalitarians are right and there's women in all these different roles, if there were women elders and women teachers and overseers of churches, if, if this is normal in the New Testament times, then I need to rethink perhaps my understanding of other passages like first Timothy that talks about women being silent in the churches, uh, or that's first Corinthians or in first Timothy, where it says that, um, Paul says, I don't allow a woman to teach or have authority over a man. Like we may have to rethink our understanding of this and say, Hmm, I'm not going to make Paul contradict himself. So what is this? So this is kind of a big deal it has an effect on us. So, um, reminder, the playlist for the entire video series is down below, but now we're going to launch into it. And the first lady we're going to talk about is Nympha. I read a quote earlier. I'll read some more from egalitarians and I'm, I'm hoping you guys find this tremendously helpful and useful because no, nobody who offers these summaries, at least on YouTube and in the sort of easy, publicly accessible teaching sphere is going this deep and exposing as this many sides in detail. And so that's why I wanted to create a resource that was doing that. So that's going to be down below. All right. Nympha Colossians 415 talks about someone named Nympha and or Nymphas, depending on your translation. So this is, um, before I read the verse, I, I want first to read to you the claim from Lynn Kohick. Dr. Lynn Kohick, who's a wonderful lady, actually I had a chance to talk with her a while back, but she's on page 186 of Discovering Biblical Equality. Um, very, very like well-known and well-respected egalitarian scholar. Here is what she says about Nympha. Notice her case, and then I'll read the verse because I just want you to see how that lands. So um, there it is. Lynn Koich says, <clears throat> in this case, Paul speaks of a woman leading a house church that meets in her home. There's little doubt that she's an important person for Paul singers, singles her out for special acknowledgement. So is this correct that, that Colossians 4.15 quote speaks of a, of a woman leading a house church that meets in her home? Let's read the verse and tell me what you see. Greetings, uh, give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. That's the whole verse. Does that mean she was the overseer of a house church? Was she leading a house church? Belleville assigns Nympha the title overseer. She actually uses that title of Nympha, we'll see as we keep reading quotes from her. So how does she get there? How do you get from Nympha having a church in her house Right? The church is the people and they're in her house. So greet the church in her house. Doesn't even call it her church. It's not like it's called her. It's just the church, the people in her house. Greet them. How does she go from there to, to Nympha being an overseer? And let's look at the case. She says, because the church met in her house, most commentators correctly conclude that she held some sort of leadership role within the church. Um, I want to point out a couple things here. Um, once she says most commentators, and I spent a lot of time trying to chase this down. Uh, she says most commentators agree she held some sort of leadership role. But I also want to say some sort of leadership role is incredibly vague. Right? Is, is she an overseer of a house church, as we'll see quotes from egalitarians that claim that? Or has she, does she have some sort of leadership role? Because I would argue that the, the person who is a, a greeter at the door has some sort of leadership role. You know, so we... We're, we're getting fuzzy with our thinking here. Um, now, for the most commentators claim, she does have a quote in her footnotes that references one commentator. 
because I was going to chase this down. Really, is it really most commentators agree Nympha is a, a leader in the church because of this phrase? And her, I can't, I, I'm going to tell you my survey of 18 different commentaries and what I came to in this. But I'll read her footnote from that spot in the book. She says, uh, Margaret MacDonald concludes that Nympha, quote, no doubt played a key leadership role in the churches of the Lycus Valley. Notice this, that um, uh, Margaret MacDonald, there's only one commentator reference, so I can't look at multiple commentators. It's just Margaret MacDonald and then Margaret MacDonald again. But Margaret MacDonald goes even further than saying Nympha is a leader in this one church. She actually makes her a key leader in multiple churches in an entire region, the Lycus Valley. So not just a church in her house, but do you see the stretching that's going on here? This is something I've complained about a lot, and I'm going to keep complaining about it because it's a bad idea, is when we take this, the, the text of Scripture and we stretch it really beyond what it's giving us. Um, I trust God enough to not want to apply his word where he didn't seem to want it applied. So I did a survey. I looked at 18 different commentaries in order to see... Um, basically just find out if there were any commentaries that said that Nympha was a church leader um, or if it was the majority. So I looked through 18 commentaries. These are just the names of the commentaries. I won't share the notes I took on each passage. That'll make this video even longer than it's already going to be, and it's already going to be long. But three of the commentaries I surveyed said that Nympha was a leader, one of which says it was far from certain that she was a leader. So three lean towards Nympha being some kind of leader, just vague leadership, not being an overseer. And the um, one of the three says, hey, this is, quote, far from certain. One of them says there might she might have been a leader of the 18. One says she might have been a leader if you can prove that hosts were leaders, that hosting a church made you a leader in the church. We're going to come back to that. That's a really big, important claim. 14 of the 18 said, I don't that they don't conclude that she was a leader or so like they actually deny it. She was not a leader or they just don't even acknowledge it. Even though they write about Nympha in detail, they don't even acknowledge the potential that she's a leader because it doesn't seem like it's on their radar. So three out of 15 is not most commentators. Now there are egalitarians on this list. Um, I just, I just went through every commentary I, I had on uh, Lagos Bible software. I have a bunch depending on what package you get there. And yeah, that, that was my conclusion. So I'm saying that this is questionable scholarship at this point because I don't know who are most commentators. Do you just mean most commentators who are egalitarian? Which, of course, is circular reasoning. That's like me saying, most complementarians agree with me. Like, that doesn't really prove my point that I have a solid interpretation. So, we need to go deeper on this claim, though, because I see it pervasively. For those of you who are interested in digging deep on these issues, looking up the books I'm referencing, you want to look up Discovering Biblical Equality, um, you want to look up Linda Belleville's work, Lynn Kohick's work, that kind of stuff, you're going to need to know this claim is going to come up multiple times, that if a, if a woman was said to be hosting a church, she was therefore a leader of that church. Let me show you a clip from uh, Linda Belleville. Linda Belleville says, Mary, Lydia, and Nympha are overseers of house churches. Now that word overseer is a biblical term. That's, that's a term for elder. Elder and overseer and bishop are three terms for the same thing in, in the scripture. So when we hear that Nympha was a overseer, this is a massive claim. And it would be, I mean, we obviously want to know if it's true. <laughs> I want to know that. But is it the case? So three people are said to be overseers and there are three verses that are given to support it. And, um... Let me take you to my next clip. This is also from Linda Belleville, who talks about how she defends this claim. And I went deep on this particular claim and discovered um, serious, egregious scholarly error, I think, on this topic from multiple scholars on the egalitarian camp. Okay, I'm just going to call it as I see it. Um, but let me, build, let me explain to you guys. I'll build a case. Because this is considered, I mean, this stuff, like the, wherever I put it, the Discovering Biblical Quality book is considered like, top drawer, brand new, like best egalitarian scholarship on the, on the topic. Right. But it has some serious, um, issues. So, um, but this is from uh, Linda Belleville, who's a contributor to that book. And this is a quote from her in the two views on women in ministry book. She says among the Lycus Valley churches, Nympha surfaces as another woman leader. Paul greets her at the close of Colossians. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters in Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. While the reference is brief, the implications are noteworthy. And here's her conclusion. Patronage of a house church was an authoritative role. The householder in Greco-Roman times was automatically in charge of any group that met in his or her domicile. 
Now, this is a huge and bold claim. It makes anybody who has a church meeting in her house an overseer elder of that church, which it could be true. The problem is it's not true. <clears throat> One of the issues with this would be that it makes rich people leaders. You see, the church had to gather in wealthy homes in the early in the early times like not because rich people are more important but because they have bigger homes like so so like if you've ever done local church ministry you know that when you go to people's homes you're one of the questions you have to ask is is their living room big enough for our group and so it would be common for people who had more finances to host churches which would make you more likely to be in leadership if you're wealthy which is of course not really consistent with what we read in the book of James or even the activity that we see of um, leadership in the church, that they're not, they're not necessarily wealthy. That's more rare. But there's um, several other problems, including scholarship problems. But let me just first take us to the text of Scripture. Imagine for a second if there's a rule that meeting in my home makes me the leader of your group. Then how do we read Luke chapter 9? And the reason why I'm starting here is because you guys can test historical claims by reading the text of scripture, a historical book, to see if those claims match the things we're reading. And so Luke 9, 1, and he called the 12 together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, no bag, no, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, shake. Uh, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So based on this theory that being the homeowner makes you in charge of the group, that means that when the apostles went out, they went into a total stranger's house who just met them, who hosted them. They are now the leaders of the apostles. Do you feel that that doesn't work? Like they're just hosts. They're not, they're not the leaders of the group. In Acts, now you might say, well, that, that's Jewish context, um, <clears throat> not Greco-Roman. Perhaps, okay. Um, but let's, let's read on. Acts 6, 16, 15. After she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you've judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to, to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Who is this? This is Lydia. Remember one of the people that was mentioned was Lydia. Lydia is a overseer of a house church according to, um, um, was it Kohik or Belleville right now? I'm just blanking on it. <clears throat> uh, but it's, it's in the video. <laughs> just back up and, read and listen. <laughs> so this is Lydia. Um, she just got saved five seconds ago. She invites them to her house and now she's an overseer in the church. Do you see how the historical text does not match the claim about history that's being given by these scholars? Um, N.T. Wright said it's 75% certain that if, if, if someone was meeting in your home that you were, you were going to be the leader, uh, or no, hold on, the 75% claims about Phoebe later, we'll get there later on. So Acts 16.15, that seems to be incompatible with the claim that a, a woman is a leader of a church, or anyone's a leader of a church just by being a host. Acts 12.12 12 is another, another example. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark where many were gathered together and were praying. Here we are in the book of Acts, and this is <clears throat> uh, Peter being delivered from prison, and he goes to the house of Mary. And apparently Mary is the leader in the church because they're gathered in her house and praying. This seems forced. This, this just seems forced upon the text of Scripture. When... Um, right here in this, in this quote, Linda Belleville, she actually calls Lydia a house... Over, house church overseer and Nympha and Mary, house church overseers, she quotes these passages and it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. So let's go back to Colossians chapter 4, verse 15. Here it says, Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. To me, it just means she has a church who meets in her house. He remembers her fondly, says, Greet her greet the church that's gathering in her house. But Linda Belville, uh, Kohik, others want to stretch this into overseer. And that doesn't work for Lydia's case. That, that is, She's a brand new believer. She's not an overseer in the house church. Paul's like, don't lay hands on anyone when they're, when they're uh, new. <laughs> so that doesn't make any sense. They're just meeting in her house. Um, why would Timothy, here's another argument against this. I won't go into detail for the sake of time. But Timothy and Titus were to go and appoint elders in the churches. These churches already existed, guys. They were meeting in houses, meeting in homes. 
And yet we have these guys going to appoint elders. But if you already have a home you're meeting in, you already have an elder if the egalitarian claim is true. So that doesn't make any sense. Why do I need an elder in a role that in a home that already has someone in that role? And that's because they weren't, because they were hosts, not leaders. You could just look at every passage in the Bible where host is present and realize it's silly to project overseer onto that. Uh, Peter's mother-in-law, right? Peter's mother-in-law is, is now leader to the apostles. The homes in 1 John who are warned about aiding false teachers are also leaders of those false teachers. It doesn't make any sense. What, yeah, that doesn't fit the context. The Pharisee who served dinner to Jesus, he's, he's a leader of the church now. Uh, Cornelius in Acts 10 was apparently an overseer in the ha in the church before he was actually a Christian. <laughs> so it doesn't really make a lot of sense. So I only found one source. The question is, what, what support is there? I can only find one source, and this is what Linda Belleville on page 37 of the Two Views on Women in Ministry book, what she says is her source. And it comes from page 76 in this book, The First Urban Christians by uh, Wayne Meeks. So... This is a scholarly work that's just, it's the social world, the Apostle Paul. It's an interesting book. Um, it was a little difficult to get a hold of, but I got it. And here's what we found. There are points that Meeks makes. Um, it's kind of turning into a tongue twister here. There are points that Meeks makes like this. There were groups formed in households headed by non-Christians, like the four mentioned in Romans, and he mentions these verses, not to mention the familia Caesarius, so, or the family of Caesar. Um, this, I want to point out, is her source <clears throat> on the same pages that she references, page 76, on the same section she's referencing. He says, there were groups formed in houses headed by non-Christians. That's her source. So how is it that being the homeowner makes you the overseer of the church? This seems to be against even her own source, but it actually gets worse. Um, and this is, I think, poor scholarship. I'm sorry. The head of the household by normal expectations of society would exercise some authority over the group and would have some legal responsibility for it. This is from Wayne Meeks. This is page 76. This, I think, is the quote that she was looking at or, or referencing us to. The head does exercise under normal expectations of society, quote, some authority and have some legal responsibility. Okay, so he does believe this. Some authority, some, does that mean overseer? No, but it just means some. Okay, so maybe there's some there. But this is true in today's culture as well. When you meet in someone's home, even as a, as a church, you know, if you've done home gatherings in churches, you know that the owner of the home isn't necessarily the leader of the group, even though they do have some role, like where they go, hey guys, don't use that bathroom, use that one. Hey, okay, it's time everybody come together. Like they tend to have some sort of mild leadership role that I wouldn't consider to be overseer. But this is the most important quote from Meeks. His evaluation of how do you combine the idea that normally there'd be some authority, but did that apply to the Christian church where you see sometimes people gathering in non-believers' homes? Here's his conclusion. That hierarchy of, of Greco-Roman households, of homeowners having authority, offers no clue, he says, to the source of the kinds of power and leadership that rival and prevail over the position of householder, either in the person of the itinerant apostle or his fellow workers or in the charismatic figures in the local group. Apparently, there were other models and social ideas at work. This is on page 87, not his quoted part. I, I put in bold a couple spots for you guys of uh, the first urban Christians by Wayne Meeks. This is the source that is offered, the only source that I've found for egalitarians on this. Doesn't mean they don't have others they point to. It's just the only one I found. And <clears throat> he outright refutes their position, right? Some authorities typical for heads of households, but Wayne Meeks goes on to say, this gives us no clue as the authority structure of the early church. I'm gonna say this claim I hear over and over again, that if a woman was was the head of the, uh, was. I shouldn't say head of the home. We'll have that debate later. If the woman was uh, the owner of the home that the church is meeting and then that she's therefore the overseer. This claim I hear over and over again, it seems completely false. It seems completely false. Um, the only pushback I can think is Jason. Uh, in the book of Acts chapter 17, we read about this guy, Jason. And this is the, the one biblical passage people will go to to support the idea that women, um, leaders, home leaders, homeowners were leaders. All right, Acts 17 verses 5 through 9. But the Jews were jealous 
And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. This is where uh, the leaders in the church here are staying. They're staying at the house of Jason. And so they go to Jason's house because he's the local who lives there and they hold him accountable for the preaching that's going on. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city, uh, authorities shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason, this Jason's in trouble now. Jason has received them and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar saying there is another King Jesus. So this is considered like evidence that the homeowner was the leader in the church. Actually, this is only evidence that the culture around them considered the homeowner somewhat responsible for the group meeting in his home. This isn't the church holding up Jason saying, Jason's our leader. This is the culture around them outside the church saying, Jason, we can't find the people that you're housing, but we found you and we're going to punish you for the things that you that, uh, that they're doing because we consider you responsible for the people in your home. It doesn't have anything to do with church hierarchies. And that's exactly what Wayne Meek says. So it's just the same as it is today. Being a homeowner gives you some degree of responsibility for what happens in your home, but it doesn't make you a spiritual leader to the people who meet in your home automatically and certainly not an overseer of the church. So let's go to the next one, which is Euodia and Syntyche. Euodia and Syntyche are um, two people that according to Linda Belleville are among, quote, the overseers and deacons at Philippi. Now I want to be careful here. I'm not saying Euodia and Syntyche um, couldn't be one of these roles. I'm saying that you can't say that they were. <laughs> There's a difference. Like, we just don't know what's going on with them. But let's read the passage first. And I want to just read, before I give you the claims of how um, Linda Belleville will defend this claim, I'm going to read it to you in detail. Before I do that, I just want to read Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. And this will give us the verses themselves. And again, ask yourself, how do you get out of this? This is this matters to me. How did you get out of this? That they were overseers and deacons, or at least one of those group, one of the two. I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. They're obviously active in ministry. They've labored side by side. Right in the gospel, they've done missionary work, done something very important, like and real work for the Lord. And He wants them to agree, and He asks somebody to help them to get along. There's some other person who no, we nobody knows who it is, <laughs> his true companion, whoever this person is. <clears throat> and how do we get from there to them being deacons and overseers? And this is uh, how Linda Bellow's case works. We'll still deal with the passage on the requirements for deacons. And, and guys, I'm going to fall on the side of thinking women can be deacons. Spoiler alert. I'm going to build a case for that. And this is an area where I, my mind shifted from what it was many years ago. Um, but I don't, want to t I don't want to stretch the scripture. So deacons and overseers. Were there any female, this is quoting Linda Belleville on uh, page 60 of the Two Views book. Were there any female overseers or deacons in the early church? Euodia and Syntyche are described in language that places them squarely in the ranks of one of these two positions in the Philippian church. And then she quotes Philippians 1.1. 1, 1, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. So the only language we have to describe Euodia and Syntyche is right here on your screen. He wants them to agree. They labored side by side with him and the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So all, all the people who w did ministry work with Paul, they're in that category. Okay. To me, this is the only category, but she says, ah, but Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, and, and this is where I have to guess at her logic. Okay. This is my best guess at her logic because she doesn't explain is Paul greets the saints who are in three categories. They're saints, overseers, and deacons. Okay, so there's saints, overseers, and deacons. Three categories of people. And so she figures, Euodia and Syntyche are mentioned later in the text. They must fit one of these categories. And we're going to eliminate saints and say they specifically fit one of the last two, deacons or overseers. Why must they fit one of these categories? Like, I, I don't know this. This logic doesn't work for me. 
Why can't they be evangelists? Why can't they be hosts of house churches? Why can't they just be influential ladies in the church? Why can't they be, I don't know, saints? Even if they do fit one of the, one of the categories, why can't they fit the saints category? What rules that out? Like, does everybody who works with Paul in ministry is, has to be an overseer or a deacon? They can't just be a saint? Like, it, it just, anyway. That being said, it just seems like a big stretch. Um, there's also a possible rebuttal to Linda Belleville's position, but well, let me first show you how she uses this data. Remember that Paul says, hey, hey, stranger, <laughs> hey, my, 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 my friend, help these two women. He says this in Philippians 4, help these two women. And so Linda Belleville says, um, if they weren't leaders or deacons, if they weren't overseers or deacons, he says, she says, otherwise, Paul would have no need to make a public appeal to a third party to help these women with work out their differences. Then she quotes the passage there. I plead, you know, plead with you to help them. So um, this seems like a stretch. Uh, it seems even more likely that if they were leaders, he wouldn't appeal to someone else to help change their behavior. As a leader in church, if somebody wrote me, wrote me a letter and they wrote to their church and they were like, hey, um, I, 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 you know, tell Mike and so-and-so to get along. And then he addresses some other person and says, hey, help them get along. Like that's, de that's demeaning. If you're in leadership, that feels demeaning. I I'm just saying the vibe I get from it is he probably would not appeal to an a third party to help them change their behavior if they were like in that leadership type role. At least it just doesn't seem like it helps her case. This is a third quote from her, from Linda Belleville on them. For him to go on and specifically urge Euodia and Syntyche, whose names, who he names as co-workers and partners in the gospel, in the cause of the gospel, uh, to be of the same mind in the Lord, indicates that their role was so distinctly a leadership one that their disagreement put the unity of the church in jeopardy. So here two reasons are given for her case. The fact that Paul gives their names and... Um, calls them co-workers and workers in the gospel and all that sort of thing, that that means they have high standing, like leadership positions. And the fact that Paul specifically calls out their disunity, that, that that's such a big issue to Paul, that's evidence that their role was, quote, distinctly a leadership one. I think this would hold true on either hypothesis. Like they could be leaders causing division or they could just be influential ladies. Ladies that... You know, the body of Christ in the early church, we're not looking at mega churches where a bunch of people don't know each other. There are a bunch of families that live in, in community, you know, that they, they spend time together, they gather regularly, they take care of each other's needs. And so if you have even any influential non-leader person who's upset with someone else who maybe has influence in their own families, it can cause major division in the church. I think that that would also explain, or at least equally explain the data. I, I've seen how the disunity of non-leaders can impact an entire congregation. I've watched that with my own eyes. So I think that what's happening here is we're just forcing, we're just forcing scripture. Um, let's talk about Priscilla and Aquila. Okay, so we've talked about Nymphos, we've talked about Euodia and Syntyche, um, and they don't seem like they give proof for deacon or overseer roles or eldership roles yet. Um, but a very relevant passage, and one that I think... Um, complementarians sometimes don't look at closely enough is Priscilla and Aquila. There's actually six passages where Priscilla and Aquila are actually talked about. Let me share with you guys those verses. They do exist. There they are. Um, here's the passages. Now, you'll notice this. Priscilla and Aquila are a married couple. But of the six times that their names are mentioned, four four out of those six times, the wife's name is mentioned first. In that culture, that's just that's just counterculture. It's just not typical. You don't typically mention the wife's name before the husband's. And so this leads to questions, right? This is again against expectations. And people are like, hey, maybe Priscilla was a more, more prominent Christian and more well-known or notable than her husband to the believers. And so that's, or at least to Luke and Paul. And that's why when they talk about her, they often put her name before her husband. Um, Paul actually spent time with them. He was a tent maker with them. They, um, yeah, they're pretty interesting to read about Priscilla and Aquila. But probably the most interesting moment, the most interesting scene from their lives that relates to this issue is in Acts 18, when we have a woman teaching a man theology, and it seems like a good thing. All right, Acts 18, 24 through 26. 
Now, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. Uh, this is happening where? Ephesus. Please remember that for a few weeks from now when we're in dealing with Ephesus, um, <clears throat> where some claim that there were no educated Christian women to teach in Ephesus. Um, he was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he had an accurate but incomplete theology. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So this is just really interesting that what, what happens here. This is doctrinal education, theology, being taught theology of a man by a couple, but the wife might have been the, the more active person here. And I say might have been because her name appears first in this direct context. There's other contexts where Aquila's name appears first. Here Priscilla does. I don't know if, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a stretch or, you know, I should say it's a bit of a guess because uh, I'm not going to lean on it. But it may be that Priscilla was even more active than Aquila. But even if she was less active um, in the actual dialogue, she's definitely active because it says they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. This is a doctrinal education of a man, Apollos, who is, ends up being a very prominent leader in the church. And it happens in private. That's true. So those are the things it is. It's real doctrinal education. It's actually theology. She's not just sharing devotional insights. It's not a woman just sharing stories from her life. She's like, well, actually, Jesus is, you know, fits the Old Testament this way. Actually, Apollos, here's the things that you're missing in your theology of salvation. Like, I mean, she's giving him important stuff. Um, however, what it's not is it's not public teaching like an elder does. She pulls him aside. It doesn't happen in, in a synagogue context. I, I read one egalitarian scholar who was like, in the synagogue, a woman's teaching. And it's like, uh, <clears throat> no, she, they took him aside. <laughs> so this was not happening <clears throat> in the synagogue, it seems, and not as a public thing. So it's not public teaching and it's not formal or institutional. It doesn't appear to be connected to authority at all. It's just two well-educated Christians helping a less educated but gifted person to get better theology so he can do better ministry. Okay, I'm not going to discount that at all. If we extrapolate the example of Priscilla and Aquila here into like a principle, it could be this. In principle, um, let me make my screen a little bigger here. In principle, a woman can instruct a man in doctrine at least, in at le minimally, in private or informal context, and perhaps with a husband present. I say perhaps with a husband present because I'm trying to build my case slowly. This is not my landing point finally, but I want to say you can't deny that. You can never say, um, well, a woman can't teach theology to a man, especially if that man is like potentially a leader in the church. You know, she he can't be learning from her, but, that, but this example is here for a reason. Okay, so now let's ask about the husband's involvement. Why was... Aquila there? Was that because, for instance, she needed a covering? You know, in the complementary circles I've been raised in, <clears throat> this statement would be, well, you know, she can do that role that might seem like a like we're bending roles a bit, but it's okay because she has her husband there and he's like the covering. Was Aquila functioning as a covering for her there? Um, let me just say this. I, I hesitate on this complementary view. I've always been a little suspicious of it because it felt so vague to say, well, he's the covering, so it's okay. He's the covering. First off, I don't know what that means, covering. Like functionally, what does it mean? If the husband's there and he's the covering versus there and not the covering, what are the differences between that? I don't really know. And so I just hesitate on leaning on that. Such a vague thing. Um, and it's it's not it's it, it's not actually clearly biblical that the wife can do X if the husband's there physically as a covering. Like I don't see that in scripture anywhere. So I'm going to set that one aside and ask, why then was Aquila present? Is it, does it matter? Did, did Aquila have to be there for Priscilla to be able to teach Apollos? And I have two other options. And one is it could be because it would just be inappropriate for her to be alone with Apollos in their culture. And even in our culture, it's, a, it, it's sometimes considered strange that your wife is alone with some other man. <laughs> um, but most certainly it was considered incredibly wrong and bad in their culture. And we probably should get more down to that direction in all honesty. So her husband's with her because of that, that could be, but, but the problem is here now, Aquila is just like a spare tire. He's just there for cultural, like permission for her to have. So really Priscilla is doing all the talking and Aquila is just standing there. 
to be like the male escort. I think rather my third option it makes more sense. It could be because of partly because of social issues, but also because Aquila and Priscilla both had important things to tell Apollos. This ex this explanation fits the context because they took him aside. They explained the, the the way of God to him more accurately. They both are skilled at understanding the theology of Christ. They both are able to communicate it to Apollos and they both share it with him. Uh, that explanation seems to fit things. Now, let me talk about terminology. Um, we're going to launch from Priscilla and Aquila. Over, to, well, let me just give you a conclusion real quick before I do that. Those who think women can only share non-theological insights, right, or that they have to stay away from certain like topics of theology, I think that's incorrect. And I think a lot of women in complementarian churches feel like, ooh, I feel like I'm talking about doctrine right now, not just sort of devotion. And so maybe I, I shouldn't talk about that. And I think that that, um, the example of Priscilla is partly there to break that attitude. I think women should talk about theology. And that if we stunt them from not talking about it, we stunt them from not understanding it either. And it does great harm and not biblically either. There's, there's several reasons in scripture why this is a bad idea. But there are terms used of Priscilla and Aquila. Paul calls them fellow workers. And here's a whole other branch of egalitarian argumentation. And it goes like this. Hey, when Paul calls somebody a fellow worker or a co-laborer or a fellow laborer, when he uses these words to describe them, he means that they are leaders in the church. They're not just people who do ministry. They're, they're leaders in the church. This is a egalitarian argument I hear all over the place. And so we're going to take a, a little sidestep off Priscilla and Aquila for a moment to talk about this idea that fellow workers means leaders. Um, let me give you a quote from Linda Belleville, who really pushes this. Uh, Craig Keener pushes it as well. Um, I, I've just seen countless egalitarians. Like almost everyone I read seems to talk about this. Um, let's go to this Belleville quote. She says, indeed, that call that Paul calls women laborers and fellow workers means that what is said of other leaders must apply to also to them. I'm going to take a drink of water while you ponder that quote. Is it true that being called a laborer or a fellow worker means that whatever is said of other leaders has to apply to you? And the answer is no. But let me read to you some quotes from uh, Tom Schreiner, who I think <clears throat> is a long, long quote I'm going to read. I think he tackles this really well, and I'm just going to read through his stuff. This is from uh, the Two, View Two Views book, pages 280 and 281. I thought this was really um, well, well said. So Tom Schreiner says, Paul celebrates <clears throat> the contributions of women in ministry. One of his favorite terms for those who assist him in ministry is synergos. I know that's a why there, but that's what they do when it's a Greek upsilon. So synergos, co-worker or fellow worker. The lineup of co-workers is impressive. Timothy, Apollos, Urbanus, Titus, Epaphroditus, Aristarchus, Mark, Jesus Justice, Epaphras, Demas, and Luke. And sorry, the text is smaller on this one. But co-workers are not limited to men. Priscilla is also called a sunergos, a fellow worker in Romans 16.3. Euodia and Syntyche are uh, common, commended as co-workers in Philippians 4.3. We just read that. And Paul says they struggled together with him in spreading the gospel. Paul also often uses the verb, um, it's so small I can barely read it, kapiao, uh, kapiao. Copy O, sorry, that's a O. It's easier to read it in Greek than it is with these English <laughs> lyrics. Uh, to designate to labor, to designate those involved in ministry, so there are those who labor. Indeed, the term uh, copy O, I should just look up the Greek, I can't, I can't read it in the English, uh, often describes his own ministry. So he calls himself his own ministry, his labor. In some texts, leaders are said to labor or work hard. What is remarkable is that a number of women are noted by Paul as having worked hard. Mary and Tryphena and Tryphosa and Persis. Egalitarians conclude from this, here's the whammy, they conclude from this, that the women functioned as leaders in the church. So Paul uses these terms, I'm going to summarize, and he uses these terms of a bunch of people. Many of the people he uses the terms of are leaders. Therefore, all of the people he uses the terms of are leaders. Follow that? <clears throat> so I read on from this quote from uh, Tom Schreiner. 
We ought not to miss a point both egalitarians and complementarians can agree on. Women were obviously significantly involved in ministry. And they worked hard in their ministries. But the evidence does not clearly indicate that, a woman func that women functioned as leaders for the terms are fundamentally vague on the matter of leadership. We know women worked hard in ministry, but these terms do not tell us they functioned as pastors. The flaw in such reasoning is easily apparent if we consider the case of the Apostle Paul. Let me construct a simple syllogism. Paul the Apostle often describes his ministry as labor or hard work. Point two, a number of women are said to labor in ministry. Point three, therefore, women functioned as apostles. Right? You would, to use the same logic, you'd have to say women were, these, all these leaders were also apostles. Now, some might want to say that, and then they're just being obtuse on purpose, I think, um, beyond the text of scripture. <clears throat> the logical flow here is immediately apparent, for labor is not unique to or distinctive of apostles. People can labor in ministry without being apostles. Similarly, women can labor in ministry without necessarily functioning as leaders. Can I just say, Paul calls them laborers and we're taking the word labor to mean something way more than labor. He calls them coworkers and we're taking the term coworker to mean way more than coworker. Do you have fellow coworkers at your job, fellow laborers who aren't your, your boss? Yes, you do. Because that describes everybody at the, at the company. It's not a term for leadership. It's a term for labor. Um, I do think we could say, <clears throat> based on the actual context, the way Paul talks about these women, and he talks about them being fellow laborers, they labored in the gospel, <coughs> is to say that they didn't just labor in um, servicing the church in general, but in evangelism and church planting. So I do think we can get from the term, not just coworker, but from laboring in the gospel specifically, as well as Priscilla and Aquila doing tent making with Paul, traveling, doing the, the, the ministry he was, that they were laboring with him in was church planting and evangelism. So I think that women as church planters and, evangel and evangelists, in the broad sense, the question is what stage ministries do you, do you supply for the people in those categories is a separate issue. But that seems to be strongly affirmed. Um, <clears throat> and we have other reasons for that too in the New Testament we'll, we'll get to later. So it just seems weird. Um, women were seriously active in more ways than some people are comfortable with, right? They were co-workers with an apostle, meaning I think church planting work, not just showing up for church services. They were active in laboring for ministry and they could go places in their culture and reach people that men couldn't, which is true. So you you might want them. Uh, later on in, in church history, we see men and women doing different ministry roles because like during a baptism, you have a woman who's helping baptize a woman or anointing with oil. The uh, One of the rules they had later in the church was uh, an elder, you know, he will come and he'll anoint with oil, but a woman would be there if the oil had to be placed anywhere other than like just the forehead. And so that was like a special ministry that that woman had. Um, and she had to be appointed to that role and was actually called a deacon in church history. Interesting stuff there. So women were seriously active, but the terms coworker and co-labor, they're too general to attach roles of authority to them, especially as a proof text. So I think this is symptomatic of like, I'll call it kitchen sink argumentation. I'm going to scour the New Testament and anything that could in any world be used to say that women were in leadership, oh, I'm going to use that. And then but what, what gets me is how so many egalitarians echo these same arguments. And to be honest, people don't check footnotes. People don't go back and read. They just read the argument. They go, well, that sounded convincing to me. There were tons of women leaders in the church, you, you ignorant complementarians. And that's why I'm doing this series. So let me give you a quick fishing analogy, <laughs> which I never do. Uh, I remember when I was young, going fishing and using a bobber. And I didn't like the bobber because it was so boring. Like I'd rather use a lure because at least I have activity, right? Because my attention span as a, as a, as a kid is about, it, you know, attention span is about as, as long as, the number of years you are alive in minutes. <laughs> so it's like eight, you get like eight minutes of attention span. And so I remember tossing a bobber out there though, and it was a windy day and it was on a lake and the bobber kept going up and down because of the little waves from the wind. And I kept yanking on the pole because I thought I had a fish on the line, but I was just seeing the, the delayed weight underneath the bobber, pulling it down after it came down from a wave. And so it made it look to me like all these false positives. And it wasn't until I got more used to checking that I started to notice what it looked like when an actual fish bit on the bobber. And this is what I think is happening is egalitarians are reeling in 
constantly all these verses that are false hits for women in leadership. Not that there's no verses that are good hits, but these are false hits. And this happens con continually so that the division between the egalitarian and complementarian sides is that both feel they have massive amounts of scripture for their support. But upon examination, it's just to be honest, the egalitarian side has a bunch of hooks without fish on them. So, <laughs> so I, I, you know, I'd like to pretend I'm more middle road, like I'm right in between the two. No, complementarians are right. <laughs> They're wrong about issues within the camp on time at times, but there's a general truth that is absolutely solidly biblical. We're going to see continually over the next several studies in this in this series <clears throat> affirmed over and over and over again and very consistently with 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 one voice. The Bible seems to affirm these things. So back to Priscilla and Aquila. <clears throat> we talked about coworkers. Um, now back to Priscilla and Aquila. This is Craig Keener on Priscilla and Aquila. Something specific about them. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk again about stretching, the stretching that takes place usually in egalitarian circles. Complementarians do it too. I've already talked about some of that. I'll, I'll do it more. It just happens it happens more on the egalitarian side. Other passages, Craig Keener says, may fill in a few more particulars of this married team's ministry, which included instructing ministers and leading a house church. So <clears throat> notice these two claims. They instructed ministers and they led, led, not hosted, led a house church. And he has three verses he used, three passages he uses. We're going to look at each of these. Did Priscilla and Aquila instruct ministers? Let's go to Acts 18.26 and read that verse again because that's the verse he references for this. Okay, Acts 18.26. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila took, heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. I want you guys to put your thinking caps on, what you've already got them on, I know, and ask, did they, quote, instruct ministers? Well, there's already a problem, which is the pluralizing of a single event. I'm not saying they couldn't instruct ministers. I'm just saying, don't say they did things multiple times that we only know about them doing once and use that as a proof. So they took Apollos aside and they gave, explained him the way of God more accurately. But the way some egalitarians talk about this moment with Priscilla and Aquila, you would think that they were running a ministry school and Priscilla was like teaching at a seminary. And I'm going to later tackle the issue of application on these issues, on these things. And I'm, I'm open to a woman teaching at a seminary. I am. We'll talk about all this stuff as we go along, but I'm not going to stretch the scripture and I, I don't want us to get in that habit because it's going to come back to bite us in the rear end. So did they instruct ministers? No, they, they instructed one guy who was, a, who was a minister. I just don't want to turn that into them running a seminary. <laughs> um, did they lead a house church? 1 Corinthians 16, 19. <clears throat> the churches of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla together with the church in their house send you hearty greetings in the Lord. This is, again, the same claim that, that a church meeting in your house made you the leader of the church. And I do not doubt that Prissa, Pr Priscilla, that they had um, some kind of like accessible, like I wouldn't doubt someone go to Priscilla and ask a question like, can you explain this thing to me, Priscilla? You understand it. I'm not doubting that. But does that make you the leaders of the house church? Or does it make you an important part of the body who has benefits you bring to other people in the body? And I think that this is where, again, we're stretching things too far. Hosting isn't leading. I've, I've shown, you know, Wayne Meeks, the, the egalitarian source, says it, it didn't. <laughs> and so I think that's kind of important. We're just stretching things. This, this idea that hosting is leading is, is, is just permeated throughout egalitarian stuff, but without good defense, I believe. Um, also notice this, in the very context where their house is mentioned, now Aquila's name comes first. And Priscilla's name was first in most cases, but in two, it's Aquila's name first. And I just think it's interesting that when he mentions the home, Aquila's name comes first. This could be because of Paul's view of what marriage is about and how it works and his idea of a husband being the head. We will talk about that in the future in this series. Let's go to the third reference from Craig Keener to support the idea that they were um, leading a house church and 
instructing ministers. Okay, so Philippians chapter 1, verses, uh, oh, sorry, Philemon, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house, We'll, we'll notice a few things here. Priscilla and Aquila are not mentioned here. Um, but there's a church in someone's house. The church in your house. Again, hosting as being the church leader. This is the same belief that just kind of goes often without being defended much at all. It's just there. Um, but this is probably Philemon and not the other two. Because it says to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, who's, who's male. And Aphia, our sister, mentions a female. Archippus, our fellow soldier, another male. And the church in your house, the your is singular here. Your is singular, meaning that it's probably Philemon. He's the main subject of the letter. So the church is in Philemon's house specifically. So this doesn't say anything about Apia or Archippus and their role in the church. But again, Philemon doesn't seem to be a church leader, a church overseer, an elder. He, the church meets in his house. They, they have a meeting in their house. Um, in Philemon, throughout the book of Philemon, there's no indication that I could see that Philemon's an elder or leader in a significant way, and he's just a host that benefits the body. So here's my conclusions on Priscilla and Aquila. Um, further conclusions. Keener, Craig Keener, who I love, seems like a super wonderful, godly man, loves the Lord, incredible memory, great resource for Christians in many ways. His Bible background commentary is awesome. It's like total respect and love there. But I think on this area, in this quote, he overstates, in my opinion, right? he misrepresents what we know of Aquila and Priscilla. He made two claims about them, which were both unsubstantiated and the result of um, stretching the text going beyond what's written. They don't seem to instruct ministers plural, right? And they don't lead a house church. I don't, I don't believe that that's in the text of scripture. But on the other hand, to balance it out, if you want to say that women can't teach men full stop, that there's just no context in which a woman can teach a man, especially theology, right? Then you're wrong <laughs> because she didn't just encourage him. She didn't just give him a devotional. Let me tell you about how I came to the Lord, Apollos. I want you to, you know, I was cooking the other day and I really felt like God showed me this thing with my kids and they were arguing and then I, then I had this devotional moment. <clears throat> Those things are beautiful, but that's not what she was talking about, right? There, it was private. Her husband was there, which could be for various reasons. Um, but it was, it was instructing a man in theology, so that's good for us to know. There's some balance for complementarians to be aware of. I think that <clears throat> if teaching is allowed, so long as it doesn't carry with it eldership roles, and this is going to be where I softly land on this topic. I'll, I'll establish more details later. Um, but if uh, teaching is allowed, as long as it doesn't carry with it the eldership role and how institutionalized you make that teaching, it matters, um, then I don't really see the problem with it. We'll explain how to reconcile that or square that with First Timothy 2 about how women not teaching or having authority. When we get, to, We'll do a whole video on just that passage. So I think these sort of examples are by God's design. I think they balance us out. I think he gives us the rules, but he also gives us real life examples so that we can make sure that we're not uh, turning the rule into like the way that they handled the Sabbath, the way the Pharisees handled the Sabbath, right? They were so worried about violating the Sabbath, they made all these extra policies about how, how people could interact on the Sabbath. Some people are so worried about violating male-female roles that they make all these extra policies and baggage that end up causing um, a limiting of women in ministry, a unnecessarily um, paranoid attitude in every interaction you're evaluating if you think that, was that moment okay? Did I, did I, was I honorable? Did I, did I affirm that man's leadership in that random moment of my life? And I just think this is, it, it's like, it's like the Sabbath at that point, like the over regulation of the Sabbath. Um, all right, let's talk about elders, overseers, bishops, and pastors. This gets a little bit complicated because biblically speaking, um, the role elder, overseer, and bishop, and presbyter are all the same role. There's just one role with all of those titles. And I didn't know that. Like back in the day, I was told pastor is this, but overseer means you're leading multiple churches. So there's like pastors, there's lead pastors, and then there's overseers who are like, like, they lead big, big churches or lots, you know, they kind of have a little bit more control over other churches in their region or something like that. Or others <clears throat> have other definitions. But biblically, elder, overseer, bishop, presbyter are just identical. They're exactly the same. But most often we don't use any of those terms. We use the word pastor, at least in churches I've been part of. 
And sometimes we use the word pastor in the most muddy ways that are just makes this whole conversation confusing because sometimes pastors are doing things that better fit the role deacon, but they're being called a pastor or they're doing this fuzzy in between role that we don't really know what to call it. So pastor simply doesn't mean elder in every case in every church. And so sometimes a woman's called a pastor. My question is, is she an elder? In the biblical sense. So this is why I keep using the term biblical elder. Is a woman, Can a woman be a biblical elder? Because I want to differentiate between pastor and elder. I think they should be the same. I think ideally if we're going to use the term pastor to describe church leadership, it should be used for that elder category, not for every category. I think that deacon is for not elder and elder is for elder. Um, but it can be problematic because if your term for pastor refers to someone doing deacon stuff, then I don't have a problem with a woman doing that work, but I have a problem with the church muddying the definitions of leadership. Um, so yeah, it can get a little confusing, but let's talk about biblical elders here. Um, this is first Timothy five. Linda Belleville offers a case for why women were in roles of eldership in the new Testament times. And I, <clears throat> I know, um, I was interested especially in seeing this sort of thing because this seems to be an area where the Bible seems fairly clear. At least I always thought so. You know, when I was before, when I was studying it on my own and not just, you know, reading a bunch of egalitarian scholars on the topic. But she says in this passage, in 1 Timothy 5, we actually have women who are in the office of elder. Let's read the two verses. Let a widow be enrolled, enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband, and having a reputation for good works. If she's brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. All right, but that you won't, you can't enro enroll the younger widows, only the ones who are over 60. And Linda Belleville says that this is like an elder role, like they're in the official role of church elder. And, um, let me give you her three-point case before I react to it emotionally. <laughs> um, so her three-point case is, is as follows. One, they're over 60, which fits the meaning of elder in the sense of elderly. That's one of Linda Belleville's points. Um, this is what we call equivocation. When we use the same word to mean two different things. So elder is a word that has a variety of meaning. Elder means elderly. You're my elder. You're just older than me. Elder also means you're in this official office of the church which doesn't have to do with directly with your age, right? Maybe we want older people to do that for maturity reasons, but it's not a statement of their age. It's a statement of their role in office. She conflates the two. A couple other people do the same thing on this topic. So elder in the sense of being old is an elder in the sense of an official church leadership position of teaching and ruling in the church. Otherwise, there's no need to appoint elders because everyone who's elder is an elder. They're different is the point. Um, so her second point, her second point to support the idea that these are women elders in the church in the official roles, the requirement, it, it according to her, the requirements for these women elders, it quote, they parallel the qualifications for elders found elsewhere in Paul's writings. Um, they don't actually. So let's talk about how they don't. Um, they're all generally good requirements, but they don't parallel them. If you put them on a chart, you would see they're actually different. Most of the requirements for elders, though, are just good character requirements. The majority are just good character requirements. The only ones that are unique to elders are teaching, able to teach. That's a uniquely elder requirement. You have to be able to teach. Why? Because eldership requires officially teaching the church as the elder. So the woman here doesn't have a requirement that she's able to teach. In 1 Timothy 5, 9, and 10, there's no teach requirement. So we can't say it parallels elders because it equally parallels deacons. It equally parallels general requirements for godly living, actually. So um, Linda Belleville never addresses this. She doesn't address that it leaves out able to teach the unique elder requirement, the one that makes it different than deacons. So that's weird. Um, she also leaves out that there's no reference to these women being elders. They're just enrolled in what? In care. Her third point is that they're paid for ministry, that these women are paid for ministry, and that that implies that they are in official eldership roles. Um, this is squirrely for the following reasons. One, the, the, the widow is not going into new ministry. She's over 60 and all of the works that she's done in, I'll put it back up on your screen. They're all things she's done in the past. 
She has been the wife of one husband, which means faithful to her husband. She has a reputation for good works past. She has brought up children. She has shown past tense. These, this is a woman who's like not doing a lot with her life. She, she can't take care of herself. The church is going to take care of her. And she's been godly. She's served and, and done all this stuff. She's not being paid for ministry. She's being taken care of by the church who she has taken care of for, for many years. So that, yeah, that's, that's obviously this is not, it's, it's almost laughable to call this woman eldership. Um, the care that they get is primarily because they are widows. Like the first requirement is you got to be un, not just unmarried. Um, you got to be left alone after your spouse has died. This is the first requirement because they're not being paid for ministry. It's, 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 it's welfare, right? This is fi- the financial need is assumed to be the reason why they want to be included on the list in the first place. This is the primary difference between them and an elder elders. It's not a question of paying them, right? Isn't it interesting when Paul gives the instructions on you know, how to appoint elders, he talks elsewhere about how it's appropriate for them to be paid for their ministry. But in the requirements, it's not about pay. It's just about being appointed because you could also serve as an elder and not get paid. But everyone on this list gets paid. These widows are taken care of. Elders' compensation isn't even considered in the elder requirements. Presumably, it's flexible and depends on uh, what's going on. Um, so, yeah. Conclusion, uh, it's whack. Like you're going to say that w- the elderly women widows are elders in the church. And this proves that women can take the role of elder in the church and run the church. Is it's It feels like we don't care about the Bible anymore. And to see these, these arguments echoed. Now, not all egalitarians say this. Oh, let me say this real quick because I don't want to give the wrong impression. They don't all say this. Uh, Linda Belleville says this. Many others don't. But they also just sit silently by while it's happening and don't seem to comment on it, even when they're writing in the same books. And I think that that is to say that the agenda is more important than the than, than faithfulness to the Word of God in some cases. And that is a deeply concerning thing. So another passage that's sometimes cited is 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Are women elders in this passage, official church elders? Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. Do I need to comment? (laughs) Um, The word is the feminine plural form of presbyteros, which is used for the role of elder, but it doesn't always carry that meaning. Guys, it's the same as it is in English. I say elder, I mean someone older than me. I say elder, I might also mean someone in a church authority. Though many churches use the word pastor for that. On the face of it, it seems baseless for saying that women were elders because Timothy is, has instructions on how to appoint elders, but this assumes that there's already a bunch of men and women in those roles. So why does he have instructions on how to appoint them in the same book? First Timothy chapter three. Uh, point number two on why this seems baseless is the reference to older men, younger men, older women, and younger women indicates that this is just about age. This is again equivocation, right? The, the, the equivocation is, is something that we often don't notice. Same word, changing the meaning halfway through my argument. Voila. And, um, it's not a good idea. Another proof for women elders is sometimes, uh, Titus two, three. I've only seen this occasionally. This is more rare. Older women are like, likewise are not to be, are to be reverent, excuse me. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And then this is like, hey, look, here's elder, older women, and they're to teach. Now the word here is, is a uh, presbutus, which is not presbuteros, which is not the same one used for the role. This word's just used for age. Older. That's why in the English it's translated older, not women elders, but older women, because it is a different word. Um, In context, this is like 1 Timothy 5. Older women here are considered to be just, again, elderly women. (laughs) Um, But the teaching thing is what I think people grab on to. What they don't do, I I did see a, a egalitarian source do this, like literally not even read the next two verses. I don't know how... Let's just read the next two verses. Verse four, they are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. 
Now, that's not really very egalitarian, so I can understand why they didn't quote that verse. But if you care about the word of God, you don't do that. Um, sorry. I apologize. I'm, I, I, get, I get a little... I've been sitting on frustration. I'm just being completely open with you guys. I've been sitting on some frustrations as I studied this stuff for months. Just seeing a scholar make a claim and then seeing on a popular level, people echo those claims as, oh, that changed my mind. And I'm like, did you just read the verses? Like, it, And it's, it's a sad thing, but I'll try to back off. I have to be so emotional. Mike, don't be so emotional. Calm down. So they're to, to train the young women. Um, there is interesting and completely neglected teaching in the church, largely neglected, that older people in general are to be exercising a training role in younger people in general, especially men for men and women for women. And that this is actually really important in the body of Christ that um, woman is learning how to live life well from older godly women. And this is something that's radically neglected. Our, our culture and social media, this is a whole different topic, but it, it seems like it separates our generations even more and we don't interact much. And it's not, it's not healthy. Um, so, okay, the elder passage. Let's go to the ultimate elder passage, which is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. It says here, this saying is trustworthy. If anyone desires... To the uh, aspires to the office of overseer. Again, you could read overseer, elder, bishop. These are synonymous in the New Testament. He desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive, for if someone, if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Uh, remember when they said Lydia was a, was an overseer of a house church the day that she got saved? Uh -huh. uh, moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare, into a snare of the devil. So these are the requirements for elders. These are people who can be appointed as elders. This is definitely the leadership role in the church. This is like the exact specific requirements. Notice how masculine they are. Like you can't get around it. Now you, you could try, but I mean, you should at least notice it, right? Um, he desires a noble task. There are some who say this is completely gender neutral, that all these descriptions all the way through are gender neutral, but he's to be what? He's to be the husband of one wife. That's one of the descriptions. He's to be one who rules his own house well. That, that, and again, manages his own household. This, this seems to be talking about males here, specifically. And in their culture, I don't think they would have, I think that's how they would have interpreted that. In verses six and seven, it also indicates he, let me take you to verses six and seven, right? He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up, right? He must be thought well of by outsiders. It is masculine. This stuff seems very, it seems like only guys can fill these, roles of eldership. Um, so uniquely, the one requirement that's different on elders that you don't find anywhere else for other requirements is the able to teach requirement. The, the elder has to be able to teach. Everything else is character related. Um, we, we, don't need, we don't need people who are good on stage. We need people who are able to teach. There's a difference. We don't need people who um, can move a crowd. Not that that's bad, but that's not the requirement. We need people who have godly character and have the capacity to teach. These are the things. Godly character shown consistently in the world, in their home, and in their interactions with people. They're dealing with the sin in their life and the, 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 the godliness in the way that they present themselves, and they are able to teach. Because why? Because elders are the official teachers in the church. So they taught in a very official and specific capacity in the church. They specifically are carrying along the apostolic doctrine of like who Jesus is and and you know, understand the Old Testament and um, fulfill prophecy in Christ, expectations of the second coming, the doctrine of Jesus' death and resurrection and what it means, how he died to save me from my sin, and that faith in him, faith and just trust in him, turn from sin and believe in Christ and you are forgiven. Like this is the elders' roles to teach the church these things. I think this is a very strong argument against the egalitarian position. The reason why is because it's hard to explain 1 Timothy 3 because of special circumstances or because women lacked Christian education. First Timothy is written to Timothy in Ephesus. Where was Priscilla? 
Ephesus? Do, I mean, and even if you think, well, maybe Priscilla wasn't there at the moment. Yeah, but don't you think there were, which, was she the only well-educated Christian woman in, edu- in Ephesus? Like the only one in existence? It doesn't seem like this was because women lacked Christian education. It doesn't seem like it's because women were looked down on. It's just there as a requirement. And the case is going to get stronger as we go through the New Testament. That For this one role, elder, God wants men in this, in this role. That does seem to be the case. And it will get stronger and stronger and stronger as we continue moving through the scripture here. Uh, let me then walk us towards the topic of women teachers. And I'm going to touch on this today. I'll get into more detail in the future. Women as teachers. One of the ways in which um, egalitarians now regularly say that women were approved as teachers is to say that there's a rule in the ancient world that when you carry a letter, when you're the mailman or male woman, and you carry a letter from one place to another, you're expected upon arrival to teach that letter to the audience. They couple this with the idea that Phoebe was a woman who carried the letter of Rome, of Romans to the Romans, and then that she would have taught Romans to the Romans, meaning that maybe she wasn't an elder, but she was in a teaching capacity like an elder teaching this most theologically profound letter Romans to the Romans. N.T. Wright made that claim in the clip I played in the very beginning of this video. So was Phoebe an approved woman teacher who was Paul's choice for who would teach the book of Romans to the church in Rome? Uh, Craig Keener seems to agree with this. Dr. Keener, um, clip number 30. It's easy to juggle all these clips, I promise. Uh, He says, the chapter opens with mention of Phoebe. This is Romans 16. The chapter opens with, with mention of Phoebe who carried Paul's letter to Rome, hence plainly functioning as Paul's agent. I'd agree there. Given his commendation, it is possible Paul expected her to be able to explain the Roman Christians' details of his letter if she was is questioned, as letter bearers sometimes were. Now, Keener's claim is much softer than than N.T. Wright's claim. N.T. Wright's like he's here's the seventy five percent thing. He's like, hey, it's seventy five percent likely that Phoebe was going to be teaching the letter to the Romans. Um, Keener's more like, hey, if they had questions about it, they'd probably asked Phoebe and he probably expected her to explain those things to the people. Um, <clears throat> okay. Let's go to his footnote for this. So Craig Keener's defense of this is the following ancient sources, right? Xenophon's, Cyropedia, um, then, you know, he has a quote there we'll look at. Um, he says that bearers might also communicate a letter's spirit, which is a slightly more bold claim. And he has multiple quotes, right? First Maccabees, Cicero, Ephesians, Colossians. And we're going to look at these claims. The first one is Xenophon's Cyropedia. Uh, let me find that in my notes. So, um, <clears throat> or I guess that'll be the second one. First, we'll do First Maccabees, which I guess I can't put on your screen. Sorry about that. Let me come back to the Xenophon quote. Um, Okay, so 1 Maccabees 12.23. Here's the quote. We on our part write to you that your livestock and your property belong to us and ours belong to you. We therefore command that our envoys report to you accordingly. Um, This doesn't say any, this verse doesn't say anything. You look it up yourself. 1 Maccabees 12.23. It doesn't say, it seemed to say anything about the letter carrier having some sort of special authority to explain or answer questions about the letter. In fact, it seems like it's requiring that the people reading the letter can hold the envoys accountable to the letter. Hey, what you have is ours and what, our, what, you, what, what we have is yours. We can hold you accountable to that because we have the letter. The letter seems to have more authority than the envoy in this opinion in this situation. So they're not teaching and interpreting. And by the way, the whole letter is only four sentences long. There's nothing to interpret. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing to interpret here, unlike the book of Romans. So um, it has a special mention that the envoys do what the letter says. That's all it is. Let's look at the Xen- Xen- uh, Xenophon Cyropedia. Quote, this is, it says, deliver this, said Cyrus, to Syaxares, and whatever questions he puts to you, answer in accordance with it. My injunctions to you about the Persians agree exactly with what is written here. With that, he gave him the letter and sent him off, bidding him remember that speed was of importance. So here, um, Cyrus gives a letter to someone and says, hey, give him the letter and everything that he asks you, you have to answer in accordance with the letter. You, you have to stay consistent with the letter that I've written to you. Does this text show 
that letter carriers in the ancient world, it was just kind of a known thing that they had the authority to interpret or apply or answer questions about the letter. No, it shows there's a special command to the carrier, but that doesn't give us a custom. It's a special command to the carrier that in this situation, he has to like make sure he sticks to the letter and doesn't go beyond it. It's, it's a limiting thing upon that guy is what it seems like to me. It limits him. It doesn't seem to expand anything. So the injunction to answer only in accordance with what is written, that limits, doesn't, doesn't give them explaining powers. Does that make sense? I'm just saying we don't, I don't think that this is a real custom. I, I think that this is something that scholars just say. <laughs> so, um, maybe I'm wrong, you guys, and hopefully I'm sharing enough of my details here that you could notice where I'm wrong. I'm trying to be as, as transparent as possible. Let's look at, um, oh, I read the Cicero reference. I didn't see anything of substance at all in the Cicero reference. Maybe I missed it. It's, I don't think it's worth talking about. Uh, Ephesians 6 verses 21 and 22. Let's look at that passage. Does this show that letter carriers had like interpretive roles and, and, and public teaching roles? Ephesians 6 21, so that you also may know how I'm doing, how I am and what I'm doing. Tychicus the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord will tell you everything. Now, it seems that Tychicus carried the letter to, of, of Ephesians. He's carrying the letter. And then Paul says, hey, so you'll know how I'm doing. Ask Tychicus. He was just with me. This is, it seems to be interpreted by some egalitarians to mean Tychicus is explaining the letter of Ephesians. But obviously the context is totally different. Tychicus is just giving them info about how Paul is doing because he was just with Paul. That has nothing to do with the letter. If you want to know more about what I'm, what's going on in my life, ask Tychicus, he'll tell you. But here's the letter. Um, so this seems like it does nothing to help their case. Um, Colossians 4, verse 7 and 8, this is basically the same thing. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He's a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. So... The, Tychicus is giving personalized info, but it has nothing to do with the letter itself. So he's not the explainer of the letter. He's not the, we don't see that in the passage. So there's no proven custom, in my opinion, of letter carriers as teachers of the letter. And I spent some time on this. I can't find anything that supports it in any strong way at all. There's also practical challenges to this view. How hard does it make it to send a letter in the ancient world? You need someone who's willing to travel, who can carry the letter, who you can trust, who can interpret and teach your letter, like, do we really think that correspondence in the ancient world ha ha happened that way? Like, Paul's like, okay, I, this letter's got to go to Rome, but I need to wait until somebody who's skilled enough to teach Romans shows up and they can carry it over to Rome. Like, no, guys, like this, it, it just, you could tell, like, this isn't life. Life doesn't work that way. Um, so it's like, hey, are you going to Rome? Hey, I trust you. Okay, take my letter with you. <laughs> That's how it works. That's how real life works. And I mean, others have said, well, but but Phoebe would be the one to read the letter because the letter carrier is the one to read the letter out loud. And I don't know that that's actually true, but I also know this. When someone brings a letter to me, hey, Mike, Paul wrote you a letter and you're, you're one of the leaders in the church in Rome and Phoebe shows up. Hey, he's written you a letter and you go, great, Phoebe, read it to us. Like, I, I think the first thing they do is they grab it themselves and they read it themselves, unless they're illiterate, in which case there's a different reason why they need someone else to read it. I, I, I'm very skeptical of this whole, like, letter carriers are, like, official teachers of, of the Book of Rome. <laughs> it's so weird. So weird. Okay. Teaching and admonishing one another. Here's another egalitarian argument that I, I'm going to say I think is, uh, it doesn't work. Um, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Um but we should be aware of these arguments. It says, let the word of Christ, 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 <laughs> let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Let me read to you what Philip Payne says about this passage. Philip Payne says, Paul's prayer in Colossians 3.16 is that all Christians Women as well as men will have a teaching ministry. Let me read that again. That all Christians, women as well as men, will have a teaching ministry. Quote, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Do you need my help? Like, you don't need my help, guys. But 
Well, somebody does because they're like, I read Philip Payne. He changed my mind on everything. And so I'm like, well, I read Philip Payne. <laughs> so, I mean, he like I met him in person. Shining man. Like, seems like a wonderful man. I'd love to just spend time with him. He just makes you feel happy to be in his presence. Like, I'm not kidding. Like, Craig Keener's the same way, too. And uh, love the Lord. As far as I know, love the Lord very, very much. Labor hard for their... But but we, we, we got to draw a line where we go, hey, the Bible doesn't say that. Like... Teaching and admonishing one another is not Jesus wants us all to have a teaching ministry where every single Christian has a full teaching ministry. This would create such competitive, unhealthy, and bad teaching in the body of Christ. It, it would just be weird. So Paul's prayer, um, like anyone can tell the difference between teaching and admonishing one another versus having a teaching ministry. But again, I'll say to push back on some complementarians, we are to teach each other and we should all be open to hearing theology or a verse, you know, explanation or something godly from anyone in the body of Christ, not just our approved pastors and, and elders. Like, so men, women, I think we can all do this and we should all hear each other. Um, but should, but let me offer you another, in case I didn't convince you, here's another thought. If we follow that logic, teaching and admonishing one another applies to everyone. So everyone should have a teaching ministry. Everyone is also supposed to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Should everyone have a worship ministry? You might call what you do Sunday morning your worship ministry as you sit in a pew and you sing to the Lord, but it's not, right? Like it's your worship to the Lord. It's not a ministry, not if we're going to use that word to mean something <laughs> that it's always meant. So um, that just shows the problem with that, that view. So women, though, they can teach, okay? They can teach. Um in general, we should be open to learning from one another. Like I said, I, I want to avoid what I, well, I'll mention, uh, I'm almost afraid to use this term because I know someone's going to take it out of context, but I'm going to put it out there for the sake of education here. Paranoid masculinity. <laughs> I'm going to call it paranoid masculinity. Um, this phrase could be overused and abused, but here's what I mean. When people are overly concerned about checking every scenario to see if women are in submission to men in each situation or a wife to her husband in every little interaction, when you have to test every moment for a proper submission moment, it's going to cause us to read things into interactions that are never there. It's going to turn us into like a paranoid masculinity or a paranoid femininity where it's like, I, oh, did I, I'm going to give an example here. Uh, John Piper has been raked under the coals by egalitarians for this. And they, they make a point that's worth thinking about. And they say, hey, John Piper tells women, Here's how, if a man stops and asks you for directions, here's a way to give directions that still affirms his leadership as a man. And I'm like, these are Sabbath laws. This is this is like how far you can walk on the Sabbath is what this is to me. I don't think we need to spend time on this. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't want my wife having to worry about it. And not just because I don't want her to be oppressed, which I don't. I don't want her to be oppressed. I'm, not, I'm saying it's not even healthy socially if women and men are testing every interaction for submission in, in that moment and leadership in that moment, and if a man thinks, and, and for some of you guys, you've been listening to these patriarchalist guys out there, and they teach you that you have to try to you know, make yourself the leader in every moment, and all I'm thinking is, you're going to cause a lot of social problems through this with other men, competition amongst men, right? Um, division between men and women. I think this is unhealthy. If, if men are internally uncomfortable, if you as a man, if you're un internally uncomfortable with a woman teaching you something outside the office of elder, right? She's not an elder, but she's teaching you something. You're probably going to cause problems and women will feel that discomfort and it will mess up those interactions. And then women who have something wonderful to share, wonderful to say, important to communicate will hold back because they're, they're worried about how it'll be taken. This is a problem. This is a present issue in, in, in many complementarian churches. And it's something I've seen. I've seen women who I thought were gifted who wouldn't step into ministry, um, not as a, as a pastor, not like that, but they wouldn't step into serving in some way because they just weren't sure that they could. And I want to, in all honesty, I want to draw the line with as much liberty as I can biblically give with total preservation of whatever limits there are on that. And then in this realm of everything that leads up to it, I want to have encouragement for people to serve and do everything that they can do. All right, let's talk about deacons. Were women deacons in the early church? <clears throat> this is the uh, the next and probably the final section for today. I'm not going to get to apostles today. That will be in next the next video we do because it's just 
it was going to be too long of a video. <laughs> just so many things to debate and talk about. So let me just frame the discussion of deacons. Okay, elders, it seems clear to me that women were not, and we'll make this more clear as we get to 1 Timothy 2 in a future video, but women were not to have the position of elder in the church. I think that that seems clear. Um, I will talk more about that later so that conversation is not over. Um, deacons, though, could women be deacons? Now, you might not know this, but egalitarians, as you suspect, all think women can be deacons because they think they can do anything. But complementarians, many of them actually agree with the egalitarians here and they go, hey, yeah, women can be deacons. Church history actually had women deacons like all over the place throughout church history, even really early. So here's two reasons why egalitarians and some complementarians think women could be deacons. One, Phoebe is called a deacon in Romans 16.1. Two, 1 Timothy 3, after giving elder requirements, it gives deacon requirements. And some people say those requirements involve female deacons. He specifically has requirements for women to be deacons. Now, the, op the opposition, those who would come against those views would say, Phoebe was a servant of the church. Diakonos, it means servant. It doesn't always mean deacon. And she wasn't in an official office of deacon. They'll say also, 1 Timothy 3 is about wives of deacons. It's that the deacon's wife has to have certain character requirements for him to serve as a deacon. And I'm going to disagree with that view, but that is a view I used to hold many years ago. Um, but it's something I've changed my mind on slowly. And the third reason against this would be in Acts chapter 6, when they need to find seven deacons to be over the widow's ministry, they only pick men. And so that would be another uh, reason they give. So let me first define deacon. Deacon has a, a gray, fuzzy definition, and I think it's supposed to. I think it's supposed to have a gray definition. Um, the word can be used to mean uh, someone who serves others, diakonos in Greek, just so anybody doing any kind of service an employee, uh, a government worker, they're all di diakonos. But it can also refer to an official position in the church. And it is usually referring to a generic sense in the Bible, but occasionally it refers to the official position. First Timothy 3, that's definitely about an official deacon. So this official position is something that someone's appointed to, right? They don't just start doing it on their own, but they're actually appointed to or approved of. Um, it does not entail teaching and authority because that's the one difference between deacons and elders that's most notable. It's not teaching it's not, it doesn't have that same authority like the elder has. Elder has a very different level of authority in the church. Um, and it does include some sense of authority to represent the local church at least, be representational in a limited sense. Not the, I represent the whole church in all ways, like maybe an elder does, but there's a genuine measure of some leadership here. And I think that women can fill that role. Let me build my case. So it seems to focus on practical needs. Uh, deacons... While they're, I mean, it, you could just describe a deacon as you're, you're in ministry, but you're not an elder. <laughs> like that could be, I mean, that could be a definition of deacon. In Acts 5, we have the calling of seven men and they deal with widow's ministry. You guys can read this passage on your own. Most of you are probably somewhat familiar with it though, if you're watching this series. Um, but just pause the video and read Acts 5 if you haven't. So there's a, there's a weakness in my argument though. Um, while they, these are seven men, we often call deacons, who were distributing, doing food ministry, distributing ministry resources to widows. There's a weakness in the argument in that they're never actually called deacons in this passage. But I do think they were deacons, even though the word itself was not used. I don't think it's that big of a deal. It seems to fit, right? The official title might have sort of come into regular use a bit later. This is very early in the book of Acts and things are developing really fast. But the reason they're appointed is specific. Stephen and the others are given their jobs so that the, the apostles that they could stick to prayer and, and teaching. They could basically leave services, formal and informal services. And that's why they're not going to be over these other ministries. They're focused on prayer, which may have been leading prayer, not just praying on their own, and teaching. So that's why these other people come in. And, and those, you know, prayer and authoritative leading, this is something that is an elder role. Uh, apostles are apostles, but they're also elders these apostles are like Peter calls himself a fellow elder. So I think the deacon here in book of acts, it comes in and says, Hey, there's lots of ministry responsibilities other than elder, other than your main focus of teaching and leading in these ways. That's what deacons do. They still have to be appointed. They're still very, very respected for those things. So I think Stephen and others are, are a good example of deacons. Uh, it seems to have variety. So Stephen's in charge of distributing food. 
there seems to be a real measure of leadership that's in that role. Phoebe, if she's a deaconess, she was a patron and a letter carrier and who knows what else she did for the church in Cancrea or Cancrea or Centria or Centria. I don't really care how you pronounce it. So it seems to be a kitchen sink word, deacon. Deacon is just about every official role in the church that isn't elder. Children's ministry, food ministry, hospitality, prayer chain, website maintenance, sound and tech ministry, leading in the distribution of ministry resources to the body, pretty much anything that isn't exclusively elder related. Those are like deacons, right? You're officially doing this thing and you're not an elder, then you're a deacon. Now, many times churches call people pastor when they're doing things that are like deacons. That's not my fault. <laughs> churches are fuzzy on these terms. And so people are like, do you believe a woman could be a pastor? Well, I don't think that they should be elders, but if they're doing a job of a deacon, but they're being called a pastor, I just think that there's a, a label that's being used that's confusing to people. And we're not getting our labels from scripture here. We're getting them from our tradition. So deacons do whatever is needed as official representatives of their local church body and usually in some limited sphere of ministry. They have some degree of authority and responsibility, but not elder. Not like the, that of elders. So they're not making decisions for the whole congregation. That's what elders did. Um, but maybe for specific ministries within the church. They're not the official teachers of the church, but doesn't mean they can't, as they go about life, just be teaching people things about God. We're all supposed to do that. Um, everything's kind of just included under deacon. That, that's my understanding of deacon. So now let's ask the question, is Phoebe a deacon? So Romans chapter 16, verse 1. If she's a deacon, she could hold a variety of different positions in that role. But is she one? So um, here I'm reading the ESV. It says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Cancria. And in this case, Phoebe's called a servant. Now, New King James says also a servant. But in ESV and New King James, I think are the minority here. Um, NASB also says servant. Actually, let me see. Oh, I should have pulled up a few that had alternate, like RSV, I believe, in RSV. Um, I think NIV might have deacon there. Uh, but let's go to the Greek. Deacon does mean servant. The word deacon means servant, but it also is an office. So the question is, well, is this, it's like with the word elder. Does it mean older people here or does it mean the elder role? Um, does deacon mean a servant of the church or does it mean a deacon of the church? Which one is it? Um, in the New Testament, the first time it's used clearly to refer to someone who's in an official role is Philippians 1.1, where he greets the deacons and the overseers. That's a clearly use of a role. Most of the time, it does not refer to that kind of role. Um, this is what the complementarians will say. They'll say, hey, only, only two other times is it clearly that role. 1 Timothy 3.8 and 3.12. Maybe Ephesians 6.21 and Colossians 4.7 of Tychicus. He's a servant. Is he, is he a deacon there? It's a little hard to say. 24... Other times, though, it clearly refers to servant in a more general sense. Um, let me show you in the book of Romans, since we're in Romans, how the word diakonos is used in Romans outside of Romans 16. So Romans 13, 4. Thanks, guys, for sticking with me. I know this is heavy lifting stuff. I hope it's benefiting you. Um, this is not your entertainment channel. Uh, those of you who want to watch short videos, uh, go to Got Questions. <laughs> they got short videos and they can help you out. It's good stuff. It's well done. Um, but I'm not your man for uh, give me give me 30 seconds on this massive debate in the church that affects people's lives <laughs> in huge ways and where people are talking past each other, not listening, and aren't even aware of each other's arguments. Okay, Romans 13.4, it says, For he is God's servant for your good. This is talking about a, a, a soldier or a police officer type role. Uh, he's God's servant, diakonos. Well, he's obviously not God's deacon in the sense of like church leadership. There, there's something kind of official in him being God's servant that could be implied related to deacon, but it's not in the church leadership sense. Romans 15, 8. Here's diakonos again. I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, a diakonos to the circumcised. Is Jesus a deacon in the church and that's it. no i mean this is different uh he's serving the circumcised he comes he he obeys the law he walks um in accordance with the traditions and all that other stuff so um that's two examples of the word being used then shortly thereafter in romans 16 we have it used of phoebe so if you'd go just by like amount of usage deacon usually means servant not deacon as far as the greek goes 
But it's the it's the way the phrase ends that grabs everybody. A servant of the church at Cancrea. This is, she's not just a servant. She's a servant of a particular church. She. This feels like the office of deacon because of that. Let me read to you uh, what Craig Blomberg says. He says, he's complementarian here. He says, <clears throat> this refers to the office of deacon because it is qualified by the phrase of the church in Cancrea or Centria. I don't, don't worry about how to pronounce words. We don't want to pronounce any of them right, hardly in, at all when it comes to names anyways. Um, <clears throat> this implies it is an official church position and not a generic use of deacon as servant as it is elsewhere in Romans and most other times in the New Testament. Uh, now, he's not alone in this. Like Douglas Moo, who's complementarian, he agrees. Tom Schreiner, complementarian, he agrees. Douglas Moo says she was a deacon, but that doesn't make her the leader and teacher such as Paul was. So David Moo just wants to slow in his page 914 of his um, commentary on Romans. He just wants you just to slow our roll a bit and say, yeah, she was a deacon, but guess what? Elder roles involved that teaching and authority. Deacons may have involved some measure of authority, like, like as if a woman can have any authority. Hey, that's my car. What are you claiming authority? You know, it's like, let's not be paranoid about things. <clears throat> so on balance, I think she was a deacon. Okay. I, I think that the qualifier of the church at Cancrea, that is like a strong indication that she was actually a, an official deacon and that maybe the ESV and a couple of translations are doing this um, poorly, in my opinion. Um, so Belleville, Linda Belleville, however, takes Phoebe as a deacon and she stretches it too far. And this is just the common theme. And remember, I'm not just trying to pick on Belleville. The reason why I use Belleville is because not only does she thoroughly get into all these details, but other scholars I read who you might be recommending, Mike, why don't you deal with so-and-so? They're probably quoting Linda Belleville in their footnotes. And so I wanted to go to the source. <clears throat> so um, let's, uh, all right, let's look at uh, this quote from Linda Bell. She says, women are readily labeled deacons in the New Testament. Phoebe, for example, is applauded by Paul as a deacon. Why do I say this is a stretch? Because it's the same thing Craig Keener did with Priscilla and Aquila, pluralizing a singular event. Now, I think there probably were other female deacons. I just don't want to stretch the text of scripture. Phoebe is a deacon, but this is turned into like a regular habit on Paul's part. In Linda Belleville's writing, women are readily labeled deacons in the New Testament. And so I think that that's a mistake. Her footnote offers her case, footnote 61 here, on um, uh, in the Two Views book, um, page, page 47. So footnote 61, it gives her case. This is the verses that she thinks show women are readily labeled deacons. And let's, let's look at these verses. Let's look at these verses and ask, are women readily labeled deacons? Because we... I care more about understanding the word carefully and rightly than I even do which side of the argument I fall on in the end. Um, but that, of course, is why I fall on the side I fall on. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15 through 18. That's her first reference. We're going to look at these. So it says, Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia and that they devoted themselves to the service of the saints. So here we have a household of Stephanus. We don't have a mention of any women specifically. The household as a group devotes themselves to the service, diakonos, of the saints, but this is not the use of the term in the office sense. It's just they're serving the saints. This is the typical use of the word. They're just serving the saints. So we, um, yeah, <laughs> we don't see anything here about women being labeled deacons in this passage, but this is, but countless scholars and others will quote Linda Belleville as their source for this sort of thing or repeat the same sort of claims. So um, we can't say that every use of uh, deaconia or uh, diakonos, we can't say that every use of these words indicates the office of a deacon. Let me give you some examples. So Mary, she was distracted with much serving in Luke 1040. Remember her, Mary? She's busy serving lots of stuff. Lord, help, tell my sister to help me. She's distracted with much deaconing. Is if, if we take Belleville's argumentation, Mary's a deacon now in the church. Um, the 12 apostles were deacons in Acts 117 because they were served, they were serving. Just do a word search on, you know, that word in the Greek. If you guys are able to do that, you could use like a stepbible.org to do something like that. So women are randomly included among, among the household of Stephanus. Apparently the whole household 
and women are included, so they're readily labeled deacons. That's the first verse that she uses. Let's go to the next one, 2 Corinthians 8, verses 18 through 24. This is another passage where I honestly don't even know how it relates. So I'm going to read it. I'm going to ask you to tell me. <laughs> how is this women being labeled deacons? This is in her footnote for Paul readily labeling women deacons in the New Testament. With him, we are sending the brothers, the brother, there's a guy, who is famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. And not only that, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace that is being ministered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our goodwill. We take this course, not that... Um, we take this course so that no one should blame us about this generous gift that is being administered by us. For we aim at what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. And with them, we are sending our brother, whom we have often tested and found earnest in many letters, but who is now more earnest than ever because of his confidence in you. As for Titus, he's my partner and fellow worker for your benefit. As for our brothers, they are the messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. So give proof before the churches of your love and of our boasting about you to these men. Every guy on this list is male. No women are mentioned. I don't see where deacon is mentioned. I don't know why that's in her footnotes. Um, but it's a big claim. They're readily labeled. <clears throat> Philippians 2 verses 19 through 30. I'm going to read this large section of scripture. Does it relate to the topic of deacons? Are women labeled as deacons in this passage? Um, there's no explanation in the footnote, so we just can read the passage. I don't see it. Um, <clears throat> I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, but not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, your messenger and minister to my need. Right? I think that might be a diakonos there. Um, I actually don't remember. Uh, for he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill near to death, but God had mercy on him and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. All men, no deacons, <laughs> no deacon of, in, 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 in an office sense mentioned at all. This is concerning because I want you guys to think for a minute how many people would read Discovering Biblical Equality, wherever, where did I put the book? I move, I study in different places. Um, <clears throat> how many would read the book though, Discovering Biblical Equality and just walk away thinking, dude, there's tons of female deacons in the New Testament. Now, I think that women can be in a deacon position. I'm not, I'm not saying they can't. I'm saying we're putting wrong ideas in people's heads about the Bible and then they fight with each other about it and the Christians are dividing and arguing on this stuff and I don't like it. So great if you know if you encounter someone who makes a claim, let's graciously take them to the passage. Hey, show me where it is in the verse. Let's look at it together. So this is concerning to me because most of you guys don't check footnotes, to be honest, right? You don't have the time and the energy to go through and check the footnotes of every verse. You just look, you see a footnote, you figure out they probably have support and they move on. So on balance, in my opinion, Phoebe does seem to be a deacon in the church, right? She seems like she really is a deacon, but there's one more thing I'll mention about Phoebe before we go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and I'll show you why I think women can be appointed as deacons based on that passage. It's a little nuanced, my view, um, which I think is correct but I'll submit it to you for your consideration. But first, let's go to Philip Payne. Philip Payne talks about um, this issue, and he mentions that, well, you just need to look at it. Okay, Phoebe's leadership role is evident in Paul's request in Romans 16 too. Receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and give her, give her support in whatever matters she may have need from you. For she has been a leader... A leader, leader, chief, president, presiding officer, one who stands before, that's the word prostatus in Greek, of many and of myself as well. Philip Payne not only says that Phoebe was a deacon, but says that Paul considered her his personal leader. And it's because of the word prostatus. This is a Greek word that we have here. 
and it's translated as leader by Philip Payne, is she Paul's leader? Right In Romans 16, is she Paul's leader? Um, the word prostatus is usually translated as something else, like a patron, a helper, a benefactor, and a, 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 someone who assists. He translates it as leader. The way he does this is he quotes the LSJ. LSJ is a um, uh, the source where he says, and we're going to get into the Greek a little bit here, okay? But this is important because we're going to find here is there's a significant error um, that needs to be talked about. So um, the LSJ is a Greek resource that does say that this word prostatus, actually the, the, the male term, this is the feminine word, but that the male term for this word means leader, chief, presiding, uh, pre presiding officer or president or one who stands before. And so then, you know, Philip Payne takes that translation and adds it into his, his translation. Therefore, Phoebe's not just a deacon. She's a, she's Paul's leader. Like if a woman can lead Paul, how can she not lead others in the church? And um, here's what you guys need to understand. The LSJ as the lexicon, it focuses not on biblical Koine Greek, which is a smaller category of Greek, but a broader category of classical Greek and like Attic and this other stuff. That's the LSJ. It doesn't even mention once in its long article on prostatus and the related, related words. It doesn't even mention the New Testament and the New Testament use of the word. It's not giving us a New Testament use of the word. It's not focused on the type of Greek the New Testament is written in, in this passage in particular. So where do you go if you don't go to the LSJ? Well, you go to somewhere like BDAG, BDAG, right? The, this is an abbreviation for a lexicon that focuses on New Testament Greek and is considered very reliable and respectable. And in their definition of the word prostatus, they have the following. A woman in a supportive role, a patron, a benefactor, the relationship suggest, suggested by the term is not to be confused with the Roman patron-client system, which was of a different order and alien to Greek tradition. That's the entry on BDAG on prostatus, on this exact word. So, it, this is bogus. This is bogus. Philip Payne's, I, I, think, I think this is just bogus. It's as though we looked at a bunch of, you know, lexicons, found one that doesn't focus on the Greek that I'm actually reading, use its reference, turn Phoebe into not just a deacon, which I'd agree with, but a leader of Paul. And then now you've got a, a really strong case for an egalitarian view. So yeah, um, that's a problem. Now, I checked translations because here's my next thought was this. Are there any translations that actually translate this as leader that put in Romans 16 too, that Phoebe's my leader, not just a patron, someone who helps pay for and support my ministry. Like she's really helped and blessed and taken care of us. She's probably a businesswoman. That's why N.T. Wright calls her a businesswoman. Um, so I checked 11 major translations. All 11 have terms like, all 11 have terms like patron, helper, benefactor, great help, or assisted. These are terms. I checked ESV, New King James, NASB, LEB, NCV, RSV, NIV, NRSV, HC, SB, CSB, NET, ISV. So that's actually 12. So I checked all those. I found one translation. Do you guys like to know what it was? One translation that says that Phoebe was a leader. Can I, let me read to you what they said, and then I'll tell you what, what translation it was in. She's being She's been a great leader and champion for many. I know, for she's been that even for me. That's the translation, the only one I could find, and maybe there's others, but I just, of, of the survey I did, that I could find where Phoebe's called a leader, and it's in the Passion Translation. All right, let's look at 1 Timothy 3. <laughs> let's look at 1 Timothy 3. Um, this is the final passage we're going to look at today. And we're going to ask the question of what, can women be deacons and deaconesses? And um, the first part of the passage, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, that deals with eldership requirements. We already looked at, looked at that stuff. Verses 8 through 13 talk about deacons. And the question I want you to ask, knowing one thing, in verse 11, the word wives their wives is a bit of a guess. It's it's gune or whatever. It means women. And it can mean wife. And the translator has to try to guess at which one is being meant in the passage. So this could mean women, likewise, or their wives, likewise. It could mean either one. See if you can figure out what it means. So deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first. 
Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise, or women likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Um, so there's a few arguments as to why this could mean not wives, but women who are functioning as deacons. And there's some arguments against it. So um, the first argument for it is the word likewise. So verses one through seven, we have requirements for elders. And then in verse eight, he goes deacons likewise, and he gives requirements for deacons. Then in verse 11, it's gune likewise, and there's requirements for women. This feels like three part requirements for three different groups for all groups who will do ministry. And that, that word likewise seems to take these women and put them closer to the category of verse eight of deacons. And that's an interesting, it's not the whole case, okay? It's just interesting. But the requirements themselves, which I'm going to put on your screen, here's a table that I made with my incredible skills, with my Microsoft Word power skills of these terms. Okay, so the requirements for deacons are on the far left column. The requirements for women or wives, however you translate that, is in the middle column and a little bit of notes I put on the right column. So the 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 claim from the egalitarians or from those who support women as deacons, many complementarians do, is, hey, the requirements are like identical. Like the women are being told to do the same kinds of things as the men, implying that they're doing the same kind of ministry as the men. So um, the, the deacons have to be dignified. The wives are also told to be dignified. The deacons can't be double-tongued. The wives can't be slanderers. These do seem like parallel claims. They can't be addicted to much wine. The wives have to be sober-minded. They can't be greedy for dishonest gain the deacons, and there's no corresponding statement in the wife for the wife on that, or the women. They have to hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. There's nothing about the wife there. And they have to be tested first and then serve if they prove themselves blameless. But the wife has something about it, or the women, that the deacon men don't. And that is this phrase, faithful in all things. So as you can see in my notes on the end, I think that the phrase faithful in all things encapsulates not greedy for dishonest gain, holding the faith with a clear conscience and being tested first and proven blameless. Faithful in all things is a catch-all. It easily encompasses all of those. And it's understandable if Paul just laid out those requirements that he then uses a summary statement rather than laying them all out perfectly identically again. My conclusion, this is the part that I didn't catch when I'd studied this passage at a younger age. These do look like qualifications for doing ministry, not for being married to people who do ministry. <laughs> They look like qualifications for doing ministry and they at least parallel the deacon's qualifications and those are for the purpose of the deacons doing ministry. So are women considered deacons in this passage? I mean, it's definitely possible. Let's talk a little bit more about it. Consider the fact, I'll add to this case, that the elders' wives have no requirements. Now the elder is the higher position. So if the elder, the highest position here for appointment in the church, if that person their wife has no requirements. Why does the deacon's wife have requirements? We have to explain this somehow. And it could be because women, whether they're wives of deacons or just women, they have an official ministry role that they're actually participating in. They're co-deaconesses, if you want to call them that, I mean, that at minimum. Um, so it appears that the on the wives' view... <laughs> Think about this. If you're going to say, oh no, those are just the, they're just the wives of deacons and deacons have to have godly wives to be deacons. But it appears on that view that elders don't have to have godly wives to serve as elders, but deacons do, even though they have a lesser role. Like how weird is that? That just doesn't, that just seems to make less sense of the passage. I think it's because these women aren't just wives of deacons. They're in ministry positions similar to their husbands doing that kind of thing. Minimally, they mirror the deacon role as the husband's going out taking care of practical ministry needs. The wife comes and she aids the women and she takes care of them. Minimally, I think they're doing that. Maximally, they're just female deacons. Now, you may not know this, but the word deacon didn't, for deaconess, the female, the feminine term for deacon didn't exist at the time. It didn't come into use until like a couple hundred years later. And so then we start getting women in church history called deacons all the time, deaconesses. Paul in one place calls Phoebe a deacon using the masculine term because it was the only word to be used. But here it seems like you don't have a word for women deacons. So it just says the women likewise in verse 11 and then gives the requirements. 
These seem like deaconesses to me. So um, this might be explained why, why they're not called deaconesses, but they are deaconesses. So let me read to you uh, what Craig Blomberg says in uh, page 148 of the Two Views book. We know from the early church, from early church history, that the, the office of deaconess was common for several centuries, granting women church leadership roles, including the responsibility to care pastorally for, catechize, and baptize other women, tasks it felt it was inappropriate for men to perform. So women's ministry was a real, a very active thing. Um, and it seems to me like there's a need for women's ministry throughout the church, um, if male pastors are going to fulfill all the roles that all the needs that women have in the church, that's going to create all sorts of problems and affairs and insufficient ministry as men try to understand the needs of, of women and we're radically different people. So I think that's kind of interesting. So here's my conclusions for today. I'm confident that these women did ministry. And they were officially appointed to that ministry. That's why they have requirements for those things. It was the functional equivalent of deaconess, whether or not they were given the term in every case. Phoebe is given the term. And I have no problem then with giving them the term as the term is invented later and used more often. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not really confident that they were not also the wives of deacons. They may have been their wives and active in ministry with them. But it's important they're not just the wives. Otherwise, the wives of elders would have been mentioned. No, these women are active in ministry. They're doing things. They're serving in an official capacity, carry some sense of leadership. How much is the question? So if I'm right, if my, my slightly nuanced view, they may have well have been typically been the wives of deacons who are working with their husbands and doing ministry needs, then um, perhaps that's why Paul was uh, ambiguous with the word gune here in verse 11, because it would generally be a man's wife, but not in every single situation, a woman had to be married because we know in scripture that singleness increases ministry. It doesn't decrease it. So there's no, all the, all the marriage requirements there are about godly marriage. You don't have to be married to do ministry. Paul makes that clear in first Corinthians seven. So, um, there's limitations on eldership that, that that's one of the major conclusions I'm going to have at least so far. And I'll build into it more as we go. Eldership seems to be just the masculine role. And, and here's a potential like contradiction among the egalitarians. Um, a lot of egalitarians want to say that the first Timothy qualifications for elders are, are, um, I was going to say ambidextrous. What am I looking for? They're gender neutral, that all those quals are gender neutral, even though I point to several that are very masculine, they go, no, those are gender neutral. But they also want to see women deacons in 1 Timothy 3. If 1 Timothy 3.11 has women deacons, it proves all that much more that we don't have women elders in 1 Timothy 3 verses 1 through 7. The deacon passage is so obviously about men that Paul has to mention women specifically and separately for people to know that they're part of this. But it's the same kind of language Paul uses for elders right above there. And he doesn't mention the women because this seems to be a role that is only for men. I think that's the conclusion we have so far. Next week, we're going to talk about, or next time, I don't know when it'll be. Well, I'll let you guys know. Um, but next time, we're going to talk about apostles. We're, we're women apostles, and there's tons of debate on this issue. And we're going to get into it in great detail. We're women apostles. Um, we're going to deal with uh, the universal priesthood of believers. If, if women are priests like men are, then how, why can't they minister and have ministries in every capacity? Um, the prophecy argument, women really did prophesy in the New Testament. How is, how is it that they, I mean, is that a teaching role? Can they teach then if it's categorized as prophecy? Is that different than eldership? Isn't that a higher role? Um, the spiritual gifts argument that women are gifted as teaching, so you can't stop them from teaching. We'll talk about that as well. N.T. Wright has a couple interesting arguments that um, women sitting at the feet of Jesus means they were being trained to be rabbis or to be teachers. He'll talk about that. The fact that Paul, N.T. Wright says that Paul persecuted men and women together shows that women were leaders in the church and not just part of the church. Um, there, there's other stuff too. We're going to get into all this kind of stuff next time around. Thank you guys for joining me. This is the exhausting study of women in ministry. And it's, and if you think it's hard to listen to it, I want you to consider teaching it after studying it. And my brain is just mush. Um, but I hope it's a blessing to you. Uh, as a quick update for those who are interested in my YouTube channel and my content, a few things I'll just throw out here. Um, I'll be with you Friday for the Q and A that's every Friday at 1 PM except for, th for two weeks after this Friday, we're not going to have it because I'm going to a conference, which is why I'm not going to be able to do this Women in Ministry series very easily 
for the next two and a half weeks or so because I'm going to be going to a conference. Um, that conference is in Arizona. I'll put a link afterwards below to the conference. It's a it's a marriage conference for those who want to go. Eventually, video footage will get put up from that, uh, either on my channel or on some other source. I don't really know for sure yet, um, but I'll be doing that now. That means you're gonna you're not gonna hear as much from me over the next few weeks because I'm doing these other events and things that are going on. So. Forgive me for that. Um, please pray for me as I continue to do this stuff. I do try to watch your guys' pushback and feedback. I have a scholar who actually sends me a little write-up every time after I do one of these videos so far of the different disagreements he has. He's egalitarian, very gracious and brotherly, and, and I look forward to reading those every every single week, even though I haven't had time to do a lot of interaction on it. But, um, but yeah, thank you so much. Please let me know if this is helping you, if I'm just giving you a bunch of random information or if this is actually assisting you. I'd love to know that. So thank you. Lord bless you.